Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In my previous videos, I talked at great length about the evolutionary history of life on Earth. In this video, we're going to start, uh, this is the first of a two-part series in which we're going to talk about human evolution, which is the story of how we came to be about over the last 8 million years or so. But we're going to start in this video talking about the origins of primates, and then we'll talk about all of the other ancestors that are part of our family tree. So stay tuned. In terms of evolutionary history, ours as a species is a relatively short one. Our species has only been around for about 300,000 years. But the lineage that gave rise to human beings actually is tens of millions of years old. Now, Charles Darwin in On the Origin of Species was the first person to really talk about human evolution, but he did so in a very short, succinct way when talking about On the Origin of Species. He said, in time, light will be shown on the origins of human beings. And he kind of left it at that. Part of the reason for this is likely because he knew how controversial his theory of evolution was going to be in the, in the public. So to talk about the context of human evolution may have actually been uh, made his book even more poorly received or more challenging to get his evolutionary ideas through mainstream society. Now, some have interpreted this to believe that Charles Darwin himself didn't believe that humans evolved, and that is completely and completely wrong he talks about it at length in several other places in fact charles darwin rightly believed that the oldest human ancestors would be found in africa and the reason for this is simple because based on morphology on anatomic similarities physiologic similarities humans are apes and as darwin rationalized with his understanding of how ancient species live uh, what can be found most likely alongside uh, extant or existing species, well, where would we find the earliest humans? Probably where we find the earliest apes in Africa. Despite this, m many early archaeologists started looking for uh, human ancestors in places like Europe and Asia. And of course, they did actually find human ancestors um, found in, in Europe and Asia and throughout the world. However, when we talk about the earliest human ancestors, the earliest members of, of species that belong to our direct family tree, we find them in East Africa, because that is where our story begins. Now, our story actually begins about 88 million years ago during the late Cretaceous. So uh, during the late Cretaceous, we still have a world that's dominated by reptiles. We have dinosaurs in the air, uh, on the ground. We have pterosaurs in the sky. Uh, we still have lots of giant reptilian species running around in the oceans. But mammals do exist. And molecular data suggests that around 88 million years ago, uh, it was in this backdrop that the primate lineage, the lineage that would give rise to our species as well as all other bipedal apes, diverged from that of other mammals. Now, it wasn't until about 55 million years ago, during the early Eocene, that we find the first true evidence of actual primates in the form of fossils that have been identified as true primate fossils. Now, about 15 million years ago, during the mid-Miocene, we would see hominoidia, or great apes, diverge from the lineage of the gibbons. That lineage, about a million years after that, so about 14 million years ago, still during the mid-Miocene, we would see the African apes diverge from the orangutans. Now, members of this African ape group would then give rise about 9 million years ago to a group known as the Hominini. So the Hominini are uh, human beings, chimpanzees, and bonobos, and all of the species that are more closely related to those species than the remainder of the great apes, i.e. the gorillas. And then around 7.5 million years ago, evidence suggests that there was a split in the lineage where chimpanzees and bonobos go off on their own course, and then another ancestor uh, of ours goes off on our course, giving uh, rise to the Hamanina. And the Hamanina is the tribe to which we belong. And those are the ape species that are more closely related to us than they are to chimpanzees and bonomos. Uh, the primary characteristics of that group are uh, a, a steadily a trend towards increasing brain size as well as bipedal walking. So there are several characteristics, both morphological, anatomical, physiological, that that distinguish groups, uh, members of the tribe Hominina, uh, from the remainder of the apes. As I mentioned, uh, one of the most, one of the first ones to actually appear was uh, bipedal walking. 
So um, while the earliest species were likely knuckle walkers, you know, walking around on two legs, but also using their knuckles for support, we start to see changes in the anatomy of these species uh, to a more bipedal lifestyle, eventually reaching full bipedalism uh, a few million years ago. We also see a trend towards increasing brain size. Now, this didn't happen all at once. In fact, it actually lagged behind bipedalism. This was actually a great question um, in, in the early investigations of human evolution of which came first, at larger brain size or bipedal walking. Uh, interestingly, most people were actually on the side of um, large brain size. The thought was that the large brain would come first and then that would give rise to bipedal walking. Instead, the fossil evidence suggests it was the opposite because the earliest human ancestors that we see in Hominina uh, actually have brain cases that are roughly the size of a chimpanzee. And we really start to see brain case sizes increase in earnest over the last two and a half to three million years. And we'll talk a little bit why that might be the case in just a little bit. So the next question becomes, why did bipedal walking appear in the first place? Now, there are lots of different reasons why evolutionarily bipedalism is favored. One of the first is a change in the environment in which our ancestors lived. So around somewhere between 7 and 10 million years ago, we know that there was an uplifting of the East African area in which the earliest human ancestors were found. And it went from being sort of a jungle biome, a tropical rainforest biome, to being a savanna. We go from very tall trees where climbing and moving from tree to tree, brachiating, uh, is very, uh, very important, to being a grassland type environment where um, you know, being a four-legged walker could actually make it challenging. So being bipedal allowed you to actually get your head up and to see over those tall grasses to look for uh, food sources as well as to avoid predators. It also, um, one of the things we also know is that bipedal walking is actually significantly more energy efficient. In a savanna type environment, you're not going to be relying on moving from tree to tree, nor are you going to have food that's as plentiful. So there might have to be more searching that goes on to find food. So bipedal walking actually reduces the energy expenditure needed to, to move from place to place. It also has the benefit of actually being more intimidating. So when you're living in an environment full of hostile predators, being bigger can actually deter predation. So one of the things they'll tell you in some cases, if for example, you're targeted uh, by a wild animal. Some of the things you can do to defend yourself is actually to be big and loud and look scary. Predators will think twice when they think they might actually have to have a fight in order to get their food because if they get harmed, that could impair their ability to actually survive. It also freed the hands to do stuff. So early on, hands were used for climbing. However, one of the things that freed hands allows an individual to do is to do other tasks. For example, to gather low-hanging fruit or grab gather fruit from the ground and carry it while walking on two legs. It would eventually allow the young to be carried. So you could actually carry your young in your arms as opposed to on your back, which allows you to do other things uh, while walking and making it easier to move with your child. Another thing hands were good for eventually was for utilizing tools. So we'll see in some of the earlier human ancestors that tool use was actually quite common. And the ability to use tools uh, to either hunt for food, to cut up food, or to start fires, or to build things, becomes a very important characteristic of this particular group of species in order for, their to, in order that for them to survive in the relatively harsh environment of East Africa and to the other places to which they would migrate. Being bipedal also reduces your profile. Remember, savannas are hot, sunny, dry places. One of the ways to protect from losing heat, from being damaged by the heat, is to be bipedal. If you think about what happens on a summer day uh, when you're standing around, it's nominally your head and your shoulders that take the brunt of the solar damage in those situations, which is why it's important to put on sunscreen in those particular areas. If you're a quadruped, if you're walking around on four legs, it's actually a large proportion of your body, your head, your neck, your back, the backs of your legs, all of those things are actually exposed to the sun. So being bipedal actually reduces your profile. It reduces your exposure to the sun, which could also help to keep you cooler and protect you from being damaged by the sun's harmful rays. So bipedalism could have evolved from any one of those particular selection pressures or most likely a combination of all of those selection pressures working together to favor a more and more bipedal lifestyle for the early human ancestors. Of course, bipedalism didn't come freely. It required a number of adaptations to occur within those species that were formerly walking around on four legs and now we're gonna be walking around on two. So one of the early adaptations we're gonna to start to see is we're going to start to see a strengthening 
of the knees and of the ankles. So if you're going to be carrying your full body weight on two limbs as opposed to four, those limbs are going to have to be more robust. So one of the things we start to see is a strengthening of where the ankles are, where the knees are, and also towards the top of the long bones like the femur and stuff. They're going to start being a little bit stronger because you're going to be carrying the full animal's body weight on just two limbs instead of four. There are also going to be changes to the length of those bones. Uh, what we start to see uh, as, we, as, we, as a general trend in this particular group of, of species is we start to see a gradual lengthening of the legs and a shortening of the arms. If you're not going to be walking in a, tetra, in a, in a quadrupedal fashion, uh, there's no reason for the limbs to be of equal length. In fact, it's beneficial to have longer legs, which are being used for movement, and shorter arms, which are being used to grasp things, use tools, climb, and so on and so forth didn't happen all at once. None of these anatomical changes happen all at once, but we start to see it as a growing trend. We also start to see some changes in the pelvic structure. We're going to start to see where uh, differences in where the leg bones connect. So rather than having sort of a wide, broad pelvis, we start to see the pelvis take on more of a bowl shape in human beings. We're going to see the top sort of widen and flatten out, and this is going to allow the femur uh, has to attach at a subtle angle. This subtle angle is going to start to shift the body weight underneath uh, the center of mass as opposed to being sort of out the back like we see in quadrupeds. Uh, this, of course, is going to actually change some things as well. This bowl-shaped pelvis is going to be wider at the top but narrower at the bottom. This gradual change does have the benefit of making the center of gravity more conducive to bipedal walking. The downside is, in females, it's actually going to cause, uh, it's actually going to cause the birth canal to shrink. Uh, this is going to be even more problematic in our lineage, as at a certain point, heads are going to start to get bigger. So we have a smaller birth canal, but a bigger object that needs to make it through that birth canal. And we've talked about this in previous videos, but this is going to lead to sort of that stabilizing selection of birth weight. Baby can't be too big to make it through the birth canal or baby and mom die. Baby also shouldn't be too small because the baby's probably malnourished. I'm not going to revisit that here, uh, but that is sort of where this comes from. Another thing that, that occurred in order for us to shift our center of gravity more under the mid portion of our body is the spine is going to start taking on more of an S shape. So if you look at the, uh, the spinal column of a quadruped, it's fairly straight, slightly arched, but ours has a strong S shape to it. And the reason why is that allows us to get our butt underneath us. It allows us to walk much more comfortably in a bipedal fashion. Now, a lot of these compensations um, aren't great. And the fact that we carry all of our body weight on, on two legs, the fact that our spine sort of curves underneath us, this is actually a source of pain in many individuals later in life because quite simply put, even though they've been reinforced and they're strengthened, they're not perfect structures. They're good enough to help us walk better, but it doesn't preclude us from developing pain uh, later on in life as a result. One other compensatory change we're gonna see is the movement of a hole in our skull known as the foramen magnum, which literally means big hole. Um, this is where the spinal column actually connects to the brain. So this is where your spinal cord runs up through uh, your skull. In quadrupeds, it is more posterior. It's on the back of their head, and the reason why is their heads point forward when they're in their quadrupedal fortune, uh, fashion, so they're able to see forward and beside them while they're walking. Well, if you ever tried to dance with your dog or your cat, you'll notice their head points straight down, or head points straight up. And the reason why is their spinal cord is running straight up through the back of their skull. Our form of magnum is actually, is actually on the base of our skull. It allows us to get our head on top of our shoulders as opposed to pointing upward like we would if it were mo more posterior. So what we start to see in these, and these, and these bipedal species is a gradual movement of the foramen magnum from the back of the skull more anterior towards the fore forward portion of the skull until it's resting straight underneath our head, allowing our head to sit on top of our shoulders, which is much more conducive to bipedal animals than it would be to a quadrupedal animal. Now, the other thing we start to see in the uh, in the Hamanina lineage is we start to see an increase in brain size. And to be clear, we really don't see a major change in brain size throughout most of the lineage until we get to about 2.5 years ago, and then brain size increases dramatically from that point forward, leading to the fairly uh, robust large brain size that we see in Neanderthals and, um, and Homo sapiens, or modern humans. Now, why this why this happened is, um, again, just like we see with bipedal walking, there are lots of reasons why it might have occurred. Uh, one of the major reasons, uh, that one major possible explanation for why we may actually be as intelligent as we are, why we see this increase in brain size, is actually due to socialization. 
um, there is a correlation between uh, brain size and the number of individuals we see sort of living in groups as a species. Uh, what we start to see is as we get more and more premature birth, it's going to rely more on socialization to make sure that, um, you know, that each generation is brought up to adulthood and the species actually remains stable. This level of cooperation actually requires a high degree of intelligence. Um, believe it or not, all of this gossiping that we do as a species, all of this communication, this cooperation that we do in order to survive and, and be the species that we are, takes a lot of intelligence to do. Uh, most other species aren't able to re maintain really such a large uh, groups as human beings are. And one of the reasons why is they don't have brain sizes uh, as large as we do. Because uh, we don't do it based on instinct like a lot of animals do. We do it based on communication, recognition, and, and socialization. Another thing uh, that may likely have been the case is tool use. So brain size also goes up around the same time we started to see the use of tools. Now, surely there's a certain amount of intelligence that must have been required for tools to form in the first place. We do see other animals, even birds, for example, that actually use simple tools. So we know that it doesn't require that much intelligence to do it. But what starts to happen, we think, in the human lineage is that over time, um, the ability to create, innovate, and utilize tools um, that requires a high degree of intelligence. And the more intelligent you are, the more the better you're able to function with those tools, the more likely you are to survive. If you make better hunting weapons, for example, you're going to hunt and more successfully get more food for your particular group and pass your genes on in, in, uh, in a higher number compared to other individuals that don't know how to make tools and don't know how to utilize them appropriately. So that's another possible explanation. And the third possible explanation is right around the time we start to see increases in brain size, we all just also start to see uh, a massive change in global climate. Uh, climate fluctuations become much more frequent and much more severe. Uh, so if you look at the weather pattern, the climate pattern during that time, we see that it was highly variable. It probably required a high degree of intelligence to sort of adjust to these changing situations and individuals uh, who were able to adjust sort of on the fly to make changes in order to survive uh, were much more likely to survive uh, than those that weren't intelligent enough to uh, adjust to these changes. So innovation, again, becomes an important part of that. Again, like we saw with the, the causes of bipedalism, the causes of increased brain size probably aren't that simple. It probably was a combination of of two or all of those uh, working together to lead to the increased brain size we see in the more recent species of human ancestors as opposed to the earlier ones. So now that we've established what it means to at least be part of the human family tree, we're going to start talking about the individuals that we see in our family tree, the fossil ancestors that we know about. Before we talk about that, I want to be clear about a few things. First and foremost, this is in no way all of the human ancestors that have ever lived that have been part of our family tree these are just some of the ones that we have fossils of and there are more of them that i'm just not talking about i'm just talking about uh some of the best studied ones at this point the other thing i want to make clear is this at no point even though i'm going to present these species sort of in the chronicle uh, chronological order in which they survived at no point should it be assumed that i am talking about this being a linear flow of one species becomes the next becomes the next we know that isn't the case. The exact relationship between these species should be interpreted as evolutionary cousins. We have no direct evidence that one species specifically gave rise to another one. We do know that they are very closely related to each other. They're more closely related to each other than they are to any other species on the planet and to us more so than chimpanzees and bonobos. But don't interpret this as sort of a linear, this became this became this story, because it's not, and it's not intended to be, and there's no evidence to suggest that it is. Our family tree is a lot more like a family shrub um, with lots of odd cousins that we're going to meet. Do we have some best guesses as to which species likely is our direct ancestor and which ones aren't? Sure. But at this point, it's all based on sort of... Um, the best evidence we have available, it doesn't prove definitively which are our direct ancestors and which are sort of evolutionary cousins and where the main lineage actually flows through. So please don't interpret it in that way. So the oldest known ancestor of ours that we've discovered is a species known as Coelanthropus chidensis. It was discovered in 2001 in the country of Chad. Um, best estimates state that Coelanthropus chidensis lived somewhere between 7 and 6 million years ago. And it has a combination of both ape-like and human characteristics. In terms of its ape-like characteristics, um, it has a, a sloping face. It has pronounced brow ridges, a relatively small brain case. 
Uh, in terms of human-like characteristics, its canines are significantly shorter than that of chimpanzees and most other primates. Um, also, its form of magnum is slightly more forward, indicating that bipedal walking was at least part of the way it moved around in its environment. We also have a significant evidence of, of from its teeth wear of what it ate. Uh, it likely survived on a diet of fruits and nuts um, and, and tubers when they were available to it. The next species is Auroran trugenensis. So Auroran trugenensis was uh, likely overlapped at least a little bit with Sahelanthropus, um, living somewhere between 6.2 and 5.8 million years ago. Uh, it was discovered in the country of Kenya, also in 2001. So Auroran trugenensis actually has um, has sort of again a mixture of ape-like and human-like characteristics uh, like we see with Slanthropus, um, Orontogenesis had a relatively small chimp-sized brain uh, but it did have uh, it did have smaller teeth with a thick enamel which is very human-like um, but one of the most important things we find in Aurora and um, is a femur bone that was discovered. And one of the things we see in that particular femur bone is a thickening uh, near the femur head where it attaches to the pelvis. As I described in the earlier part of this video, that thickening of the femur is highly indicative of increased weight bearing on those limbs, which would argue that Aurora and likely spent a good deal of its portion walking bipedally. Now, we also believe it did, like we see with Slanthropus, climb trees uh, still. So it wasn't a, a, a truly uh, non-arboreal species. It did spend a good deal of its time in the trees, but on the land, on ground, it probably walked on two legs the majority of the time. When we look at the teeth, um, one of the things we do see is that it probably had a diet similar to, to uh, Slanthropus, uh, Slanthropus chinensis, uh, fruits, nuts, seeds, roots, um, and the occasional insects were here or there. So again, a, a, an omnivorous diet uh, similar to what we saw with a Slanthropus chinensis. That brings us to a species known as Artipithecus cadaba. So Artipithecus cadaba, we don't know too much about, but it lived, uh, it was discovered in 1997 in Ethiopia. Uh, we know it lived somewhere between uh, 5.8 and 5.2 million years ago. Uh, we don't have a ton of fossils from it, but we do know a good about it, amount about it from its teeth. Uh, based on what we have from the fossil remains, we assume that it probably looked much more similar to a chimpanzee than it did to modern humans. Uh, it was most likely chimp-like in terms of its size as well as its brain case. Uh, so we're not looking at an animal that was hyper-intelligent at this point. Um, what's interesting is when we look at its teeth wear, it did not have a diet similar to the previous two species. Um, its teeth wear uh, seemed to indicate that it likely survived on a more fibrous diet, roots, uh, nuts, and things like that, as opposed to the softer diet that we see in chimpanzees of leaves and fruits and the like. That brings us to Artipithecus ramidus, which lived about 4.4 uh, million years ago. Uh, its fossils were discovered in Ethiopia in uh, 1994. So Artipithecus ramidus actually, uh, based on its fossils, looks significantly more like humans than it did than did many of the other earlier ancestors. Um, one of the things we do see with its um, with its foot bones is interesting. It did have a divergent big toe. So when we talk about a divergent big toe, we're kind of talking about what we see like with our thumb. Our thumb is divergent from our hand. And in many ch and in chimpanzees, uh, their feet look very similar. It makes it easier for them to grab branches with their feet. There's also a break in the foot that allows their foot to bend like our hands do. Note that our hand, our feet don't do that. We don't. We can't fold our feet over for grasping um, like we can our, our hands. We see that very similar foot bone structure in this particular species, likely indicating that they weren't able to grasp branches with their feet like chimpanzees could. Uh, this again would be a, a strong indication that this is a species that spent a good deal of its time uh, surviving uh, walking on the ground bipedally and using its arms for climbing as opposed to using its legs and feet uh, like we see in chimpanzees and other primates that, that live arboreal lifestyles. The other thing we see from its teeth is that it likely survived on softer foods, fruits, leaves, and even meat in some occasions. And because of the way its teeth look, because of the micro wear patterns on the fossilized teeth, we suggest, it suggests that it avoided more of the fibrous foods. It didn't eat things like tubers or, uh, or roots or nuts. Uh, simply the teeth weren't structured to handle that particular type of food. This brings us to Australopithecus anamensis, which lived about 4.2 to 3.8 million years ago. Uh, its fossils were discovered in both Ethiopia and Kenya. 
Um, we know a decent amount about Australopithecus anamensis. Uh, again, we see a mixture of ape-like and human-like characteristics. So in terms of the ape-like characteristics, still a relatively small brain. The brain case was also elongated, so ours is more round uh, and dome-shaped as opposed to theirs being more elongated. Uh, so a chimp-like brain there. We also see that uh, a chimp-like bone structure, uh, the arms were still elongated. They hadn't gone through the process of shortening like we see in more recent ancestors of ours. Um, and we start to see, and we have wrists that are articulated in a way that we're making them good for climbing. However, when we look at the lower appendages, when we look at the, the legs and the feet, uh, we start to see some indication that this again is a bipedal animal that was less adapted for climbing with its lower limbs. One of the big indicators there is the angle. The way the angle attaches to the foot is much more indicative of a species that was using its feet and legs for walking as it was for climbing. Did it spend a significant portion of its life in trees? Yeah, of course it did. So did many of our earlier ancestors. But when it was on the ground, it was likely walking in a more bipedal fashion. At least that's what its bones tell us. Now, Australopithecus afarensis is one of our best known ancestors. Um, it's type species known as Lucy is one of the uh, most profound uh, uh, examples of, of a fossil find uh, from one of our earliest human ancestors. Um, Australopithecus afarensis existed. Um, its fossils are found in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Um, and it lived somewhere between 3.85 and 2.95 million years ago. So you can kind of, if you're starting to look at these timelines, see that quite often many of these species coexisted with each other. Australopithecus afarensis is one of our best studied ancestors because we have over 300 different individuals belonging to the species that have been discovered. Um, we know that they were uh, bipedal walkers. We've actually found um, they were the first species in which we've actually found footprints that clearly show that this is a species that was walking bipedally. Now, with Australopithecus afarensis, again, we're going to see that mixture of ape-like and human characteristics. When we look at Lucy and her family members, uh, we will see that they have a brain case that is very similar both in size and structure to modern-day chimps. Again, it's elongated. We note that the facial bones were very ape-like in terms of their context as well. So we're not looking at an organism that, an, a species that has really gained all that much in terms of their intelligence. We also know that in terms of its developmental timing, uh, that it really didn't have that shortened development period like we typically see uh, in more recent human ancestors as well, indicating that socialization wasn't necessarily, they probably didn't survive in these huge groups. There wasn't that need for um, a social structure to help uh, raise these underdeveloped children. In terms of human characteristics, we're gonna look at the teeth. So again, they're gonna have the shorter canines, they're gonna have the smaller teeth with the thicker enamel. We also see in terms of human characteristics, again, when we look at the legs and the feet, this is an animal that was truly adapted for bipedalism. Does it have the bone structure and the upper appendages to indicate that they were good climbers? Absolutely. So it does have that ape-like ability to climb trees, to have a strong arboreal lifestyle, but we have actual footprints of this species walking bipedally. We can actually see uh, that while it did walk bipedally, its gait wasn't quite as similar to ours. It hadn't quite evolved that perfect bipedal gait that we see in humans at this point. So again, we're looking at a species that is sort of right in between in terms of ape-like and human-like characteristics. In terms of its diet, it seems to have a diet similar to what we've seen in some of the earlier species. It ate both soft and hard foods. Um, it likely is the case that um, you know fruits, leaves, vegetables, uh, maybe meat in some cases, uh, but it would also have some fallback foods and be able to eat things like new, uh, nuts and roots and tubers uh, if that was available to them as their only food source. So Australopithecus africanus actually existed at the same time as Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, it lived between 3.3 and 2.4 million years ago. Uh, so Australopithecus africanus has a lot of anatomical similarities with Australopithecus afarensis. However, while we do see sort of similar body plans in terms of the upper and lower appendages, we see an upper body that was still adapted for being able to climb very well. Uh, we see a face that is, is very similar in structure to chimpanzees more so than humans. We see the lower limbs are well adapted for bipedal walking, but we start to see in this particular species uh, a larger brain case. So when we look at the brain of Australopithecus africanus, it's slightly bigger than we see in Australopithecus afarensis. Do we know that means it was more intelligent? We, don't, we can't necessarily say that, but one interesting thing 
is that Australopithecus africanus is our oldest known ancestor to actually leave East Africa. If you look at where we found every other species, it's predominantly in this East Africa region, Chad, Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Australopithecus africanus was actually first discovered in 1924 in South Africa. So it's the oldest known species to migrate out of that, that Northeast African area of the continent and move south into South Africa. So while we start to see a slightly larger brain case, we're still seeing a body plan that really is sort of that half, that half human-like, half a hybrid in this particular species. Uh, again, its diet was a mixture of soft and hard foods, leaves, um, you know, fruits, um, but also nuts and tubers. And we also think like Australopithecus afarensis, that meat was at least a small part of its diet, likely in the form of small invertebrates or insects in the case of this particular species. Now, Australopithecus, Australopithecus gari is an interesting species. It lived about 2.5 million years ago. Um, and what's interesting about Australopithecus gari is we see some unique adaptations um, that we see really first in this particular species. First and foremost, uh, we do see that it still has that robust upper body, uh, which would have made it very well adapted for still climbing trees. However, it's in this species that we start to see uh, lengthening of the leg bones. So we're starting to see that lengthening of the lower appendages um, without the shortening of the upper appendages, but that's going to start allowing for a better bipedal gait, better bipedal walking um, with the longer legs. So they're more efficient in their movement in this fashion. The other really cool thing about Australopithecus gari is it's the first species in which we find evidence that they may have actually been using tools. Now to be fair, these tools are simple hand axes made out of stone, uh, but they are found near the fossil finds of this particular species. And the other thing we find are uh, bones that do appear to have some indication of butchery, which indicates that tools were used on them. It had been believed uh, for a long time that Homo habilis, or the handyman, uh, was the first known species to actually use tools within our lineage. However, it now seems that Australopithecus gari may have been that first species uh, at least 500,000 years earlier uh, than Homo habilis may have been able to do that. Australopithecus sediba is a very interesting species. It's known from a single find. Uh, we know it lived about 1.98 million years ago, and we can be so specific with the date because our evidence of this species comes from a single find in a cave in South Africa that was discovered in 2008. What's interesting is the individuals that were part of this species, the remains uh, were so well preserved that we have a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, we have these amazing fossils, for example, of their hands and of uh, many of their other bones. So we know a lot about what this species looked like and how it likely behaved. Uh, what's interesting about Australopithecus sediba uh, is that we see a uh, we see that it had very human characteristics in many ways, in terms of, for example, in terms of its teeth and its facial structure. Uh, the other thing we do notice is that it had a relatively small brain case, so it wasn't particularly hyper intelligent at this point, uh, bigger than some of the earlier ancestors, but nowhere near what we see in members of the genus Homo. Uh, the other cool thing we see is while it did have um, the, the narrow chest and the elongated upper limbs, uh, we actually see, we can look at its pelvis and see that the attachment points of the, of, the, of the femurs to the pelvis are very, very similar to what we see in modern day humans. So what this tells us is not only did Australopithecus sediba actually walk upright, uh, but it also did so with a gait that was much more similar to humans than many of the earlier ancestors did. So if we saw this thing walking um, anatomically, it would walk much more similar to us than some of the earlier species. The other thing that's interesting though is that it had this sort of unique walking pattern where it would walk mainly on the outer portions of its feet as opposed to the inner portions of its feet like we do. So they really kind of walked around the outer edges of their feet, which is uh, kind of interesting, very different from the way we walk in that case. But the way its legs would articulate uh, and move during walking would be very similar to what we see in ours. What's interesting about Australopithecus sediba is that it existed 1.98 million years ago. And this is right when we're starting to see the first members of the genus Homo come about, the genus to which we, be we belong. Uh, which really makes it sort of like this perfect sort of transition species to sort of moving from the Australopithecines into the members of the genus Homo uh, and they're sort of coexisting at the same time. So uh, it's not part of our direct lineage because they are considered to be Australopithecines, but we're starting to see how these characteristics are coming about in many different lineages all around the same time. And again, we're starting to see how the sort of human family tree isn't this 
through lineage, but more of sort of this sort of fragmented shrub rather than a family tree uh, to which we belong. This brings us to Homo habilis, also known as the handyman. He gets that name uh, from being the earliest known species was discovered in 1960 uh, to be found alongside the use of simple tools. We now know that Australopithecus gari uh, was likely the first human ancestor to utilize tools, but uh, for a long time, the only species, the early species we knew about was Homo habilis. Now, Homo habilis lived for about a million years, 2.4 to about 1.4 million years ago, and its remains are scattered throughout East and Southern Africa. Now, Homo habilis was a very versatile species, which is likely why it was around for so long. It takes, a, it takes a good amount of versatility to survive as a species for over a million years. Now, Homo habilis, um, uh, was, we find evidence of, of simple tools. We also find evidence of large animals uh, that were butchered. In other words, it would sort of chop up its food, uh, making it one of the earliest species to have consumed um, uh, large prey uh, as part of its diet. Um, this is very interesting because uh, this also correlates at the same time with a slightly large brain case. Uh, so we're starting to see what we believe to be signs of increased intelligence in the species. We're starting to get to the point where the ability to form and to utilize tools are now going to sort of act as a selection pressure unto itself. The fact that Homo habilis was so versatile is a testament uh, to it as a species, and that's why it was one of the reasons why it was likely able to survive as a species alongside many other bipedal apes uh, for over one million years uh, on the continent of Africa. Now, at the same time as we see the genus Homo evolving, uh, we also see another genus known as Paranthropus also evolving alongside of it. Uh, they not only existed in the same time, but in the same space. So Paranthropus species were found also throughout East Africa. And you should be getting a picture now of Africa about two, about three to one million years ago were full of these bipedal A species. So Paranthropus is not part of our direct lineage. They're not members of the genus Homo, but we see many of the uh, similar adaptations beginning to occur. So with Paranthropus boisei, which existed from about 2.4 to 1.2 million years ago and scattered throughout much of Eastern Africa, uh, this particular species is known as the Nutcracker Man. Uh, Paranthropus species not only had in large brain cases, but they also had this large dish-shaped face, as you can see in the picture here. This species was known as Nutcracker Man for the simple fact that it had cheek teeth that were four times larger uh, than humans. Just this massive jaw and cheek teeth that allow it to just sort of plow through tough fibrous foods. What's particularly interesting about Paranthropus boisei is that while it was able to chew through nuts and tubers and these very fibrous foods, those were likely fallback foods because it's micro aware actually shows that it probably survived on a decent amount of sugary foods, fruits, leaves, things like that. So when we look at Paranthropus boisei, uh, what we're seeing in this particular species is in a large brain case, in a lineage separate from that of the genus Homo. So we see that it wasn't just in one particular genus that we're starting to see this increase in brain size about 2.5 million years ago. We're starting to see it in two distinct lineages uh, that sort of branched off from each other around 3 million years ago. Paranthropus robustus, which lived from about 1.8 to 1.2 million years ago, has been discovered in South Africa. So uh, Paranthropus robustus, very similar uh, to Paranthropus boisei, uh, not quite as, uh, the teeth weren't quite as large, but again, we see that dish shaped face. Uh, we see the pronounced sagittal crest, so that bony protrusion at the top of the, the skull that we see in Paranthropus boisei as well. Uh, this is there to help anchor those massive jaw bones that we see from, uh, that, that are found in this particular species. Uh, while we do see an enlarged brain case, we don't find evidence of the use of stone tools. Interestingly, though, uh, there are some bone fragments that appear to have been worked a little bit, uh, which seems to indicate that this, may, this species may have used um, bone tools, for example, to uh, harvest termites and stuff from termite mounds uh, that were found in this particular region. So Paranthropus robustus, uh, again, an enlarged brain case, um, but we're not seeing uh, stone tool usage in this particular species. Again, uh, we do have those large teeth, not as big as Paranthropus boisei, but this is a species that could utilize um, you know, hard, rough food uh, when it needed to, but again, might have been fallback foods because microaware seems to indicate that these teeth were again utilized predominantly for eating softer foods, fruits, nuts, meat, uh, leaves, and that type of stuff. This brings us to Homo rudolfensis. So Homo rudolfensis is another interesting species. We know it lived somewhere between 1.9 and 1.8 million years ago at least. 
But what we know of whom Homo rudolfensis is known from a single fossil. What's interesting about that fossil, though, is that it shows that this particular species had a very large brain case. Uh, we see a brain case that is actually significantly larger than that of Homo habilis. This is one of the reasons why we know Homo rudolfensis is a distinct species from Homo habilis, despite being found in a similar area. Uh, so we're looking at a species that is its own unique species, but again, we're starting to see that trend towards a larger brain case in this particular individual. About 1.89 million years ago, we start to find the first fossilized species of Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus is the first species that we're talking about that actually overlapped with modern humans. Homo erectus survived until about 150,000 to 100,000 years ago. In other words, early Homo sapiens, in fact, lived alongside of Homo erectus. Now, we know a good deal about Homo erectus. Homo erectus is the first species that we've talked about that also has modern human proportions to it. Some of these individuals grew to be over six feet in length. We see the shortened arms and the elongated legs in this species. We see a significantly larger brain case. We see them appearing to be much more human in terms of their teeth and their facial structures. Homo erectus is the first species that we're really talking about where if you looked at it, you would start to think that this is definitely a species that could be considered to be a man. What's interesting about Homo erectus, and one of the reasons why we have so many specimens of Homo erectus, and it was one of the first species other than Homo sapiens discovered throughout the world, is because Homo erectus is the first species to actually emigrate from Africa. Its remains are found throughout the Middle East, Central Asia, and well into East Asia. Homo erectus was the first species to not only begin in Africa, but to spread elsewhere throughout the world. And in fact, some of our earliest ancestors were likely trapped in Africa because Homo erectus had established itself uh, in, in, the, in sort of the land bridges that would connect Africa to the rest of the world. We don't have significant evidence that Homo erectus really ever made it into Europe. The reasons for that are unknown, but there was a significant eastward migration of Homo erectus out of Africa into what is now the Middle East and into modern day Asia uh, by this species. Homo erectus is a truly remarkable species. Not only was it the first species to emigrate from Africa, it's the first species where we start to see some really uh, highly intelligent things happen. For example, we have significant evidence that Homo erectus cared for its elderly. It cared for its infirm. It didn't simply abandon them and say, good luck. Um, they took care of these species. They, uh, they show signs of being uh, uh, of, of, of strong tool usage. We start to see the first evidence, uh, some of the first evidence in the species of butchery. So just like we see with Homo habilis, we're starting to see um, species that are being sort of chopped up and utilized. We also know that they likely cooked their food because we see in the species for the first time the de first demonstrated uh, use and control use of fire. We find early hearths. And hearths are interesting for multiple reasons. First off, it shows that they may have likely cooked the food. The other thing that hearths are, are they a site of socialization? Uh, tribes would have gathered around the hearth to cook their communal foods or to use them as protection from animals. Both this plus the care for their elderly and infirmed indicate that there was a high level of socialization around the species Homo erectus. And this is likely directly caused by or related to uh, their significantly large brain size and their high levels of intelligence. In fact, in order for them to be able to move out of Africa, that would have required a, a significant amount of social, social gathering to be able to do that. You can't do that in small groups. You need to have communication. You need to be able to do that. So again, with Homo erectus, we're looking at a very, very intelligent species. We also know that for the first time, meat is becoming an ever important part of this particular animal's diet. The evidence for this comes in many different ways. First and foremost, uh, we see a shortened digestive tract. One of the things we see uh, in almost all carnivores is a relatively short digestive tract. It doesn't take as much time to process meat as it does to process things like plants. We also see, for example, that in order for an animal this large to survive, meat was likely to gonna, likely have to be a part of its diet. There's much many more calories in meat than there are in sort of roughage. So in order to, to maintain their large brain size, their large body size, meat would have had to have been a substantial part of their diet. So again, Homo erectus, the first species uh, to emigrate out of Africa and the first species we've talked about that will coexist with Homo sapiens when they appear on this planet. Homo heidelbergensis, which lived for about a 500,000 year sp uh, span from about 700,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago, also likely overlapped with Homo sapiens. Homo heidelbergensis is best known for being the first species to actually make it into Europe. Uh, so these were tough individuals that were able to form 
reasonably sized groups. Uh, we see that they were well adapted for their cold environment, both based on their anatomy, but they were also uh, the first species that we find that was actually able to make and utilize clothing and to develop, to develop shelters made out of wood and stone. Homo hodobergensis uh, were able, were one of the first species that we also see that were truly excellent hunters. Um, we find that they were able to work in groups, so we find um, really uh, well-made tools, spears and the like. Uh, we find hearths that were utilized to sort of cook their food, but alongside of their remains within their settlements, we find remains of large predators. We find hippos, uh, we find rhinos, uh, we find many other species uh, that uh, large species that were actually hunted by uh, by Homo hodobergensis. This again requires a large amount of coordination, intelligence to make these tools, to utilize these tools, and to cooperate in order to bring down some of these large, uh, very dangerous animals uh, that were part of their diet. Uh, the other cool thing that we see is uh, Homo heidelbergensis was the first species that has indications of ceremony. Uh, one of the things that we see actually is that uh, we find is a mass grave uh, with multiple bodies in it, which indicates that, uh, that Homo heidelbergensis actually buried its dead. Um, this is interesting because um, most species don't bury their dead, and the reason one buries their dead is typically because there's some type of uh, you know, belief in an afterlife or in some type of spirituality. Do we have definitive proof that Homo hodobergensis believed in that? We don't. But the fact that we find a mass grave uh, with multiple bodies in it is a strong indication that they had at least some type of ceremonial nature uh, to their particular social lifestyle. Homo floresiensis is a very interesting species. It's known as the hobbit. Um, it lived from about 100,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago, uh, and it was discovered in Indonesia. The reason why the species is known as the hobbit is these uh, human ancestors stood only about three and a half feet tall. Um, there's some indication that this is likely the result of a phenomenon known as island dwarfism, because on the island of Flores, where they were discovered, we also find species of pygmy elephants. Um, you know, so, so this sort of island dwarfism is a thing that we know happened on Flores. Uh, Homo floresiensis, despite its diminutive uh, 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 stature, was highly intelligent. It made and utilized stone tools. It was able to hunt uh, these pygmy elephants and other uh, small species. It was able to defend themselves against Komodo dragons that also lived in its environment. Uh, so we do know definitively this was another human ancestor that did live uh, alongside other, um, other uh, of, of Homo sapiens. What's interesting is there are some individuals that believe that Homo floresiensis might still exist. Uh, there is actually a wild man of the woods known as Orang Pendek that is believed to have still be seen in, in uh, still be seen uh, in, in Indonesia. Is there direct evidence of this? No, but it still is an interesting side note uh, linking an ancestor to sort of what uh, sort of modern day uh, cryptozoological phenomena. So I just think that's interesting. The final species we'll talk about today is Homo neanderthalensis. So uh, Neanderthals lived from about 400,000 to about 40,000 years ago. Uh, like we see with uh, the species that we've just spoken about, this is a species that overlapped with Homo sapiens and even overlapped with what we would consider to be modern humans. Um, Homo neanderthalensis actually gets a bad rap, and we tend to think of them because of their pronounced brow ridges as sort of being these caveman type people. The truth of the matter was they were not. Uh, they actually have a larger brain case than Homo sapiens. Now, this is where we start to see that just because you have a big brain doesn't mean that you're hyper intelligent. Now, to be clear, Neanderthals were very intelligent species. They not only made and utilized tools and wore clothing, they have demonstrable evidence of sort of having sort of ceremonial uh, nature. When they buried their dead, they buried them with trinkets and uh, other things sort of associated with their lives. So uh, ritual and ceremony seem to be part of their social structure. They lived in groups of 20 to 40. They were expert hunters. Uh, they lived out throughout you know, the Middle East and well into Europe. And they were probably the biggest competition that we had uh, when Homo sapiens sprung onto uh, the scene about 300,000 years ago. Now, Neanderthals were not only skilled hunters on land, there's evidence that they were likely the first species to also harvest food from the sea. So again, we need to dispel this myth of Neanderthals being these sort of non-intelligent individuals. What's also interesting about Homo neanderthalensis is that there's strong evidence that this was also a species in which we interbred. So uh, one of the things that's been very interesting as the Human Genome Project has moved forward, people are able to sequence their own DNA, 
the relative recency of uh, of the recentness of these finds we actually have neanderthal dna that we can compare to human dna and one of the things that we find is most humans have somewhere between one one percent and three percent neanderthal dna in their own genome so what that tells us is that neanderthals are so similar to modern day humans that interbreeding was actually possible now what happened to all the neanderthals well that's a subject for another video so that's the end of our little journey uh, that we're going to talk about in terms of going through uh, our human ancestors. Uh, we'll pick up with what it is to be human and homo sapiens in my next video. So I hope you'll stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot about what our human ancestors looked like. Um, like I said, this wasn't every single human ancestor that we know about. And again, please don't misconstrue this as some sort of linear story of, you know, Coelanthropus chidensis up through modern day humans. We know that that's not necessarily the case, uh, but we can start to see the overall patterns of increase in brain size and changes to the anatomy of human ancestors giving rise to the body plan that we have today. In my next video, we'll talk about what it means to be a homo sapien, what defines us separate from the remainder of these species, and what being human truly means. I hope you'll stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in.